So thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, we're going to be using the webinar format for this presentation. So we're all tuning in remotely and you won't be able to hear or see each other as attendees, but you'll be able to participate by using the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. So take a minute to locate it. Um, you'll be able to ask questions while the presentation is going on and we'll read some of them after each speaker, but also at the end of the presentation. So we're just gonna wait a few minutes while everyone joins us and then we'll get started. So thank you everyone for joining us. Tonight for this presentation, we're gonna be using the webinar format. Um, this means you won't be able to hear or see each other, but you'll be able to participate by inserting your questions into the question and answer box at the bottom of the screen. We'll be recording the presentation tonight and we'll be sending a link to all the registrants. Um, so we'll just get started. Actually, we could get started right about now with an introduction from Pat Sesto. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Laura. And uh, thank you to the Coscop Library for partnering with the Conservation Commission uh, to host this and bring our four-part series to the public. Um, I'm going to say the Zoom meetings, as much as they can seem like a hassle and we're sorry that we don't get to see each other in person, I am delighted by the level of attendance that we get um, through our Zoom meetings. Um, it's much easier to sit down in front of a screen for a little while while life goes on behind you um, instead of coming out. So we are thrilled to have another strong night of participation. Um, as a way of introduction, this is a four-part series. This is our second of those four parts. Um, we are focusing on air, land, and water, not in that order. Um, last week, we dealt with soil and the importance of that which lies beneath our feet and how the health of our soil um, is vitally important to how we survive on our land, how we eat, um, how we support our homes. Um, so much is dependent on healthy soil. So I hope a good number of you were able to participate last week and have an appreciation that dirt just isn't dirt. Um, this week, we are gonna talk about water um, as part of that series uh, with Jeff Ehrlich from Aquarian and John Mulvaney of USDA. And John, I'm not gonna get all of that. Um, but I'm sure Elizabeth is going to do, uh, do you justice on your introduction. Um, and then I'm going to round out the, the trio. Next week, please come back um, as we talk about transportation and air quality. Um, certainly over the course of this last year, we've had some lovely um, trips on 95 without traffic. We've heard many a story about how our earth is recovering while we stay shuttered in and um, lots of things are happy for that shut-in of ours. And then the final week, we'll wrap it up with climate change and how these topics all interrelate um, in our changing climate. So um, I hope you all enjoy this evening's presentation and come back for the next two. 
And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth Dempsey, who is going to be our moderator this evening. Right. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm Elizabeth Dempsey. I'm on the uh, Greenwich um, Sustainability Committee, uh, where I work on advocacy um, as well as land and water um, with some talented women. Um, so I'm really excited to hear about the presentations um, with water being one of the interests I've had recently. Um, so we're going to kick it off with um, John Mullaney. Um, John is a hydrologist in the Connecticut office of the New England Water Science Center, where he is serving as the center's groundwater specialist. He began working at the US Geological Society in 1986, uh, working on both groundwater and water quality studies in Connecticut um, and in New England. John's current projects include groundwater levels in Cape Cod and other parts of Massachusetts, um, and a topic that is near and dear uh, to all of our hearts here in Greenwich, the study of nitrogen loads um, in Long Island Sound, um, and he has uh, also served on the Long Island Sound study, which um, is a great interest to me. So we're excited to have you. Welcome, John, um, and we look forward to your presentation. Uh, thanks. Um, I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad to hear that so many people are joining. Um, I think what I'll do is let me start by sharing my screen, and let's try that again. Uh, let's see. I think we're getting there. Let me know if you can see my screen. Good. Okay. It looks like I got, uh, I'm a little bit covered up with things, but I think everybody can see it. So, um, yeah, so um, I'm a hydrologist for the U.S. Geological Survey. We're an agency under the U.S. Department of Interior. Uh, I was just on a call today with our new, uh, we had a, we had a all age, all interior department call with the new secretary of the interior. Um, uh, but anyway, this is a good topic. Um, I presented on this, um, what was I was going to say about two years ago, about this time in southeastern Massachusetts on a very similar forum. And I took some of the information that I had from that presentation, but I also uh, tried to make it a little more uh, Greenwich centric. Um, back about 20 years ago, I worked on a study with the town of Greenwich on their groundwater resources and um, we, did, we had a report back then that we worked on looking at water use and water availability and groundwater recharge in Greenwich. So I am somewhat familiar with the issues, although I know like the local issues change with time, especially as 20 years go by, a lot of things can change. Anyway, I, I thought I'd start with a picture of the Byram River in Pemberwick here where we have a, a USGS river gauge right now where we're measuring the, uh, the flow and monitoring uh, the weather as well down there. And I thought I would start with um, either our take home messages or really what I was calling uh, answers to questions. So, you know, some of our questions we get, and, and this talk is gonna be kind of about our water budgets, but you know, how much water is there? You know, how, how much water is available for use? And I think we often think of our fresh water all ends up in rivers. So, sort of say, what are the sources of water to streams and what pathway does that water follow when it gets there? How, do, how does the system vary in naturally? And then of course, how do human activities affect this system? And I think at the end, I'll touch a little bit also on just some thoughts about, to think about how, how some of these things might change under climate change too. Um, so when we think about all of our water needs, um, we live in a world where there's competing demands for the use of water. We all need water to live. Um, you know, we have com competing demands for that water for public and private water supplies uh, to maintain habitats. Um, you know, it's used for irrigation and agriculture and for residential areas. Um, some of our rivers, we, we need a certain amount of water in those rivers to dilute uh, effluent from wastewater um, or have enough water in there so we can take care of fire protection, particularly in rural areas where we might use some, you know, dry hydrants and things like that where they're off of the system. Um, it's also, you know, there's also com competing demands for recreation, uh, our fishermen, uh, kayakers, and, uh, you know, even in Connecticut, we have, um, not particularly in Greenwich, but we do have hydroelectric, uh, you know, power generation as well. Um, I just happened to show a river here, a picture of one of our uh, sites that we were, we were supposed to be monitoring flow this summer. Uh, this is up in Cheshire, Connecticut, but this is the Mill River. Um, 
which was uh, which actually totally dried up this summer. So this is kind of the extreme event, but um, we've had a couple of we've had a couple of droughts in the last few years. So I'll, I'll touch on that as well. Um, when we as hydrologists think about uh, how much water is available somewhere, we usually one of the things we often start talking about is the um, just had somebody calling my cell phone here. Anyway, one of the things we, we talk about is um, the runoff, which is kind of like the, you know, we think about the, I'm just turning off my cell phone, make sure I don't get any more calls here. Sorry about that. Um, we think about the volume of water that passes a certain point on a river. So if you could collect up all that water over the course of a, of a whole year, and then if you could take that water and spread it over the entire drainage area or the watershed that contributes to that river, how, how deep is that water? Um, you know, how much, of, and, and it turns out it's quite a bit in New England. We're in a pretty uh, wet part of the world. Um, if we look at, for instance, um, our runoff and our precipitation, one of the, one of the points I wanted to make is we tend to get a lot more precipitation than we get runoff. That kind of makes sense. But we get we get somewhere on the order of 40 to 60 inches of precipitation every year. And of that 40 to 60 inches, we probably only have about you know 20 to 35 or 40 inches that comes out of our stream. So roughly half of that water kind of just disappears. And uh, that's that's the water really, it's mostly due to evapotranspiration. So that's, that's the water that, you know, falls on trees, is intercepted by the canopy, it evaporates. That's the water that's taken up by all of our plants, at least in a natural system. So if we use kind of an average value of what comes out of our streams, it's the equivalent of about 24 inches. So think of about two feet of water over that whole watershed which is about, which comes down to about, if you think about it, it's a lot of water. It's about 1.1 or 1.2 million gallons per day for every square mile, you know? So it, there, there is a lot of water out there. Um, and I'm showing this example, I'm showing is fairly nearby Sasko Brook, uh, which is one of the sites where we have a river gauge. And, uh, you know, some of that data is available if anybody wants to take a look at it. Um, so just looking at kind of our standard uh, hydrologic cycle here, if you want to call it that, you know, we have precipitation that falls on our land surface that it's either in the form of rain or snow. Um, we get evaporation that I just talked about a little bit there. That's a lot of our, a lot of our water disappears there. You can have a, I'll talk about other places where we get evaporation, but we do get groundwater recharge. Part of that water, especially seasonally, um, sinks into the ground down to our water table and becomes groundwater that flows to streams. The other big source of water we have, we often call the surface runoff, which is kind of like you think about the water you see, you know, running down your driveway when you're, when you get a heavy rain and you see that water just flowing over the ground. Although it's, it's probably more than that. A lot of times it's probably flowing through shallow soil layers, but it's finding its way towards the stream. Um, we can get, you can get some evaporation here too, down in, you know, where you get, direct evaporation from the groundwater by, you know, trees that are, and that are right along, say, a stream channel where the groundwater table is shallow, too. Um, you know, one of the things we don't think about a lot is that, you know, between our rainstorms, which are fairly frequent, we, there's water still flowing in our rivers, right? So the water is still coming down those streams. And the reason those streams are flowing is they're being, they're being uh, served by groundwater that's discharging to the rivers. Uh, especially in our natural streams that are unregulated by dams or anything. So one of the things that we look at in terms of um, that stream flow that comes from groundwater over the long term is roughly equal to the amount of groundwater recharge that we get. So that's, it's roughly equivalent to that amount of water that soaks into the ground in our area. And it's important, um, this is an important source of stream flow in the summer. Uh, it, it keeps it keeps our reservoirs uh, keeps water flowing into some of our reservoirs when it's been dry otherwise or into our streams and keeps that cool clear um, habitat that cold water fish like um, so but one of the things we talk about a little bit with the recharge in an area like I'm showing uh, the town of Greenwich and the surficial geology here so um, 
in, in a lot of Connecticut, we get quite a bit of recharge in these uh, sand and gravel deposit areas, which are shown in orange here. So these are glacial deposits of layered sand and gravel. Um, in other parts of Connecticut, we have a lot more of these. In, in southwestern Connecticut, and particularly in Greenwich, there's very few of them. Most of the surficial material for the geology is, is a thin layer of glacial till over bedrock. So if you've ever seen one of those digital elevation maps of somewhere like Greenwich, you can actually see all the structures in the bedrock. It's so close to the surface. Uh, you see faults and fractures that follow a lot of our streams and everything. And so we have this thin veneer of glacial till. The glacial till tends to have fairly low groundwater recharge, meaning that the soils are not that permeable. Um, but they might also be because there's steeper slopes on some of these surfaces as well. So um, the things that affect the, the rates of groundwater recharge are the precipitation, um, geology, temperature and season we'll talk a little bit more about because we primarily get recharge during the non-growing season to groundwater. Um, soil type and geology are kind of closely related here, but how wet is the soil as well? Um, you know, what do we have for vegetation cover and slopes? Because in steeper slopes, you tend to get more surface runoff too. So an average rate for Greenwich area with these areas of thin glacial till is probably about eight inches per year, more or less, which is pretty small. And I should add that these, these, uh, these areas of coarse grain, sand and gravel, the stratified drift areas, these get about 20 inches a year of recharge. These, um, so they're, they're definitely areas where we get a little, little bit more water into the ground. Um, one of the things I wanted to show was, you know, how the groundwater levels change. And we, we happen to have a couple of long-term, they're now long-term observation wells that we began with the town of Greenwich back when we did our study around uh, 2001. And um, one of the things I wanted to show is the groundwater levels um, tend to rise. This is uh, actually over here. So I have the elevation of groundwater on this side and I'm showing um, precipitation events down here on this axis in inches. So each one of these is a rainfall event. And what I'm showing here is the water level going up and down in our well with the seasons. This happens to be for 2019 through 2021. So what, what, we usually, what we see a lot of is the water levels tend to start rising about in October, right around the time we get the first frost. So once those trees stop taking up the water, uh, all of a sudden we get, and we get some rain, the water starts, uh, the water levels start rising. And once we get back into the growing season around May or June, we just really start to see the water levels decline. So what's happening here is we don't get much recharge or we're getting less recharge than the amount of water that's discharging away to stream. So the water levels in our aquifer start to drop. And we do get a few little bumps here and there in the summer, even this was our drought year right here. Um, but you can see the same thing happening again at the end of our drought. When the drought finally broke from this last year in October, our water levels started to go up again. So one of the important points to take home here though is the timing of, you know, one of the things that can lead to drought is losing this time window when we get the groundwater, you know, we get recharged to the groundwater. So this, this sort of non-growing season, let's say October through May, when we get a lot of that water in the ground. And I'll talk a little bit more about these are the same, a couple of the same wells, but I was showing for a longer time period with some statistics. The red lines are the low and the high for any given month. The black uh, triangles are sort of monthly values over this time period. Uh, 2016 drought is here, 2020 is here. So we were, weren't quite as severe as in 2016, but one of the things that led to the drought in 2016 was um, a number of years where we got less than normal recharge during that important time period. Um, and on this side, I'm showing some differences here where I wanted to show that there's on our hilltops and our valley bottoms, we tend to get a different range of fluctuations. On our hilltops and our hillsides, we can have a big range of water level fluctuation, which is kind of important because I think sometimes it makes the hilltop areas, especially for private wells, maybe more susceptible to having uh, problems. Down in the valley bottom, where we're down by a river, we get a, a smaller amount of fluctuation from, from year to year. And one of the things you always think about on a, on a valley bottom versus a hilltop, you have a lot of area possibly above you where that groundwater can still be flowing in, say if you have a well there where your water supply is coming from. 
anyway, I'll move along on that um, with the graphs. But um, you know, getting in towards the end of the presentation here, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about what are some of the changes to this groundwater and surface water system due to human activities primarily related to urbanization. So, you know, some of the things that we do that change the balance of these of these things is, you know, we we withdraw water from reservoirs and we transfer water between different basins and as part of our making our water supplies resilient. Um, we have large groundwater withdrawals in some cases uh, and also private wells, which maybe are small withdrawals, but maybe we have a lot of them. And some of the things I'll mention a little bit more about is we, we, we tend to pump the water uh, in from our private wells and then return it through septic systems. And then we have impervious we have impervious surfaces that make some changes to the water budget too. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. I've got a couple more slides on these issues. And lastly, uh, I'll just mention too about other, you know, how some of our water exits our system through our sewer systems too. You know, we lose a certain amount of water just because of that transfer of water from public water supply and then discharge to a sewer or a Long Island Sound. The one thing that I don't really have time to touch on in this talk is many of these changes have implications for water quality as well. And so if we if we look at the groundwater pumping, I'll start with that being the groundwater hydrologist, I'll talk about that first. And as I mentioned before, our groundwater recharge and discharge tend to be sort of balanced over the long term. But once we start to pump groundwater from that system, we, there's two possible outcomes. We could have a decrease in the discharge end of it. So that, at, you know, if you take water out, there's probably going to be less water that discharges naturally to streams. The other consequence might be when you do the pumping is you, it, you know, the stress of the pumping might reach out and start pulling in water from other areas. So that might be we start pumping groundwater and maybe there's a pond or a reservoir or a river nearby that's got some water in it that maybe can be, you know, pulled into the groundwater system. So those are, those are two of those possible consequences. Um, I was going to add, I got a couple more slides here on some of these, some of these ways we re reroute that water. So in areas like the north of Greenwich, we have private wells and septic systems. So we pump water from a deep aquifer that's usually down in the bedrock. And then we return maybe something like maybe up to 85% of that through our septic system. Um, on the other hand, the water that we use for irrigation is often sort of lost to evapotranspiration, especially for watering correctly. We're trying to water the, the plant needs. And so that is really, that outdoor water use is often considered our sort of biggest consumptive water use. There are other probably consumptive water uses too, obviously, um, but they're small in comparison to the outdoor water use. Um, we also have areas in Greenwich, uh, or at least we did, or at least there were, you know, 20 years ago when I was working in town where we have areas with public water supply and private septic systems. So this is a case where we're actually bringing in um, wastewater as an additional source of recharge here. So this is kind of an imported source of water that's then entering locally through our septic system. And one of the things I wanted to mention about both of these return flows from septic systems is in this case, we pump from a deep well and we return and it, maybe it takes a different path to a stream or you're returning it to a shallow system where then it takes a different pathway to a stream and here, and you know, it's one of those things that may represent a change in water quality too locally, you know, if you have enough uh, density of septic systems. Um, and so lastly, the one thing I just wanted to talk about too is, you know, with our areas with public water and sewers, um, it's a little bit different, but we have water that maybe comes from our headwaters, from reservoirs and things like that, or possibly even from outside the area if there's interconnections. And then that water ends up getting discharged maybe directly to Long Island Sound. Um, so, and there, one other, one other area to think about too, and I don't think there's probably any, or there may be very few areas left in Greenwich that have this, but we do have areas in the state that have private wells and sewer systems. And so that's another case where if you pump that groundwater and discharge it to a sewer, it's kind of a, it's another source of water that's kind of lost from that water budget. Oh, lastly, I forgot about this one. We were gonna talk about impervious cover. This is actually data from my study back around 2000, where we had a couple of river gauges in Greenwich and we, we monitored, uh, we did a comparison of some storm events. So these are, this is the river flow during a couple of storm events. 
And what it shows is, you know, if you had say 10% impervious cover in a watershed versus 4% is that you get quite a different response in the stream flow. So you, when you have, uh, when you have these big rainfall events, um, the stream with more impervious cover is flashier and you get this high fast peak in stream flow. And the other thing that's notable about that is once you get past the storm, the stream flow is much lower. So the, the stream with the less impervious cover has a smaller storm peak and it's kind of holding the water for longer. This is what this is probably is release of some local shallow groundwater that's right next to the stream here, slowly going back to the stream. So, you know, you have, you have uh, the possibility of the loss of recharge too in this system, as well as the possibility of creating some nuisance flooding or, you know, eros erosion uh, type of flooding that might occur in some of our urbanized um, streams. Anyway, lastly, I just thought I would touch on um, to think of, to everybody to think a little bit about, and I, it's good to hear that maybe you'll be talking about climate change in one of the later, um, one of the later series of this, um, of these events. But, um, you know, we think about with a changing climate that we might have greater precipitation in, in this part of the world, but it might be more variable and we may have more extreme events, more extreme wet or extreme dry or for longer time periods of either. Um, we, we, we will likely see a smaller proportion of our precipitation coming as snowfall. And that has implications for the changes in the volume and the timing of that recharge and runoff. And some of the other things we think about are warmer temperatures and a longer growing season. You know, is there a greater evapotranspiration or, or will we see greater water demand? And lastly, I just wanted to mention, it's probably not particularly relevant to Greenwich, but in some areas in New England, we certainly have uh, public water supplies in coastal areas where rising groundwater levels, and especially if they're salty groundwater, as well as inundation of, you know, coastal water supplies is a possibility. So I guess with that, I will, um, you know, that's, that, that concludes my presentation on this, and I'll be glad to take some questions at the end. Great. Great, thank you so much, John. Um, that was interesting and we already have a couple of questions for you um, to, uh, so stick around um, for the end. Um, and now we're gonna turn to um, Jeff Ulrich. Um, and uh, speaking of um, dealing with climate change issues and keeping and pumping the ground, um, we are grateful to um, Aquarian and, and Jeff is a real master. He's worked um, in the water industry for over 30 years. Um, as Aquarian's water company's vice president of supply and sustainability. He oversees 85 people that produce drinking water for over 625,000 people in Connecticut. Uh, the department operates 23 reservoirs, nine water treatment plants, 101 pump stations, 328 wells, and 74 water storage tanks. Um, Jeff joined Aquarian in 2014 as director of supply operations and has a really unique perspective um, with both working for a water company and utilizing his consulting experience and contractor background. Um, Jeff worked for Acon, again at Fleming, and for the Elizabethtown Water Company in engineering transmission and distribution and construction departments. Um, welcome, Jeff. You, you and Aquarian's reputation really precedes you because I've heard for years about the great partnership um, that Aquarian has had um, with the town of Greenwich and working hand in hand, especially with droughts like we had in 2016. Um, so we really appreciate this working relationship and thank you so much for um, coming tonight. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. I'm gonna pull my thing up, uh, uh, my presentation. Uh, can you see that? Yes. And you can see that. Okay. Um, so just a quick introduction. You know, the, quite the topic of the night was, is Granite facing a water shortage? Um, and I, you know, you know, we had, you know, we talked about 2016. That's where we got a lot of experience working with Greenwich. I got particularly a lot of experience working with Greenwich around the drought of 2016. And then fall of 2020 comes along and the question is, you know, not again, what's going on a mandatory, we have to impose a mandatory irrigation ban in the fall of 2020. 
And just looking back at 2016, um, it was more, you know, we had a more extreme event in 2016, but we'll get into it. You know, 2020 was a pretty severe event as well. But if you remember, you know, that's the barge reservoir that's in Stanford. That's the reservoir that serves the majority of the water to Greenwich. Um, it got very low, got down to, um, you know, on the order of, it was like 65 days of remaining supply, 66 days of remaining supply. And we ended up making a lot of modifications to bring more water down, including bringing, putting pipes along the Merritt Parkway. Um, you know, there were definitely lessons learned from 2016. You know, it, it reminded us that we're dealing with a limited resource. Um, again, you know, the system is out, was operating at a, close to its design capacity and it's been doing that for quite a while. Um, in addition to that, there are the stream flow rules, which I, I imagine most of the people on this call know about, but um, 10 years out over now, it's under 10 years, I think it's on the order of eight years. Uh, there's a requirement for all dams and reservoirs to release more water uh, to downstream stream to, from the reservoirs to improve the water quality downstream from the reservoirs, which is a, a, seems like a fantastic idea from an environmental perspective but it also means we have less water in our reservoirs. So it's going to have, have a, a contributing effect or reduce more the water available in our existing reservoirs. So we just you know, agreed that there was a need for developing some additional modern reservoir management. There's some new things we're taking advantage of. Um, looking at demand management uh, for uh, not only Greenwich, but the towns up and down Southeast Fairfield County, and also seeing what we could do to find additional capacity. Um, this is a grad, you know, this, we had a woman uh, we worked with, she's out of Massachusetts, a woman named Amy Vickers, she's a nationally known water conservation expert, and she had done a study of our water use, and this is Greenwich, now we've got one of these for most of our big towns and some regional areas as well. There's a lot of information here, but it really pointed out where we were having, you know, where, where, where our real, um, where we thought we had the most opportunity. Uh, the green line, rep, you know, so I guess looking along the bottom, each, each group of bars represents a percentage of the customers. And this is single family water use. The green line represents how much that bar represents of the total water use. And then the blue represents winter water use and the red represents outdoor summer water use. And what you can see, so if you follow along all the way to the left, that's the average of all of our customers. And the average customer, this is total customer. So it's like you know, on the average of three or four people per house they're using on the order of you know, uh, less than 500 gallons a day. Um, you go to the next grouping and that represents 100% of the water use in the town. That's our top 1% of our customers. And what you can see is they're using 9% of the water supply uh, in Greenwich. Of all the water we supply, the top 1% are using 9%. The next grouping is the top 10%. They're using almost 40% of the water in Greenwich. And then the top 25% are using 61% of the water in Greenwich. The amazing thing is all the way to the right is the bottom 50%. Half of the customers in Greenwich are only using 18% of the water. So what, what it really pointed out to us is a good portion of, our, of the customers in Greenwich are water conscious. And 50% you know, of the customers really use very little water. I mean, that's, that's on the order of being you know, a lot of people would call like, you know, ultra, you know, ultra low water use to be using that little water and half of the customers in Greenwich are at that level. And even when um, you get to that next 25% or so, it's, it's a reasonable amount, but it's not really the top 25% that's really using water way out of range of the rest of the town. And that's where the demands, you know, that's what is really 25% of the people are creating so much demand, they're kind of exasperating the problem. And we, you know, so we really looked at that as the, having the most potential of savings going forward. So what we did do is we implemented the two day a week irrigation policy. And I think most people are aware of this. It's uh, two days a week maximum, even addresses, odd addresses, you know, Sundays, Wednesdays or Saturday, Tuesdays. And it applies to automatic sprinkler systems and sprinklers attached to the ends of hoses. It does not apply to handle watering does not apply to drip irrigation. It does not apply to soaker hoses. And the reason we chose this is when we talked you know, to our water conservation expert, also other systems across the country, this really offered the most potential uh, savings on the order of 20% savings. Uh, you know, the, the, a lot in some systems, as you can see more than that, but they have longer irrigation periods than we do. 
Um, and it was, we thought, fairly easy to implement as well. It's, it's something we could roll out fairly quickly and have a big impact. There is a variance process. You know, I won't get into all that tonight, but if you have a new uh, landscaping or you've got a big property or you've got a high efficiency, you can go through a variance process and water outside the schedule. So just looking at now 2020, so along the bottom here, I don't know how well you can see that, the, the, each group of bars represents a year. So all the way to the left, that's 2010 to 2015. Then the next group of bars is 2016, 17, 18, 19, and 20. And what they represent, the red is the amount of rainfall that we received May through August. And the green is the number of rain days. And if you look at 2016, that's the second group of bars from the left. Um, you can see that was the summer of 2016 when we had our drought and it's amongst the lowest, you know, even, uh, uh, but not necessarily a lot lower than everybody else. It's comparable to 2017. Um, but then last year, 2020 was lower in both cases. We had fewer rain days in 2020 and less rainfall in 2020 than we did in 2016. So it was a pretty dry year in 2020, uh, more so than I think most people recognized. But what we did have is if you look at the demands, so I, you know, looking at the 2016 demands versus the 2020, um, and you can see here the difference uh, in Greenwich, we received about uh, in the area about almost two inches less rainfall between May and August, but our demands in Greenwich were on your 1.4 million gallons per day lower than they had been in 2016. So we do feel, you know, we've been tracking this quite a bit that those outdoor irrigation restrictions have had a positive impact on demands. And what we ended up using was when you multiply out May through October, uh, August, we used um, 173 million gallons less water in 2020 than we did in 2016. And if you look at the graph, so this is a reservoir graph and we use these to track all of our reservoirs. The green line represents the 20 year average through the year. So along the bottom is a calendar, along the left side is the percent of the reservoir being full. You can see, you know, similar to what John was mentioning in the fall, you know, January, it's going, it's still going up. We expect this to spill sometime between March, April, May, and then it'll come again down through the summer and then start going back up again in the fall. And that's the 20 year average, the green line. Uh, the, gold li the gold line is 2016. The light blue line was 2019 and the dark blue line was 2020. And so we had less rainfall and fewer rain days in 2020 as we did in 2016. But really that blue line was able to stay on the order of 5%, you know, 10% above where it was in 2016 because of that saving. So it did, you know, it's a noticeable change in the behavior of our reservoir and gave the system you know, more capacity to get through even if the drought had been more severe. So we are happy with the results of the irrigation restrictions and the amount of water it's saving right now. And you can see it, here's another graph. So this is days of the week. So each, gra each group of the bars represents a day of the week. So from the left, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, each color represents a different period of time. The blue is 2010 to 2015. The red is 2016. The green is 2017. Uh, purple is 2018 and the light blue is 2019. And what you can see is 2010 to 2016, uh, the blue and the red are noticeably higher every single day of the week. And since we put the outdoor uh, two day week watering in, you can see that uh, since then, 2017, 18, 19, every single day of the week, the water demand has is substantially lower than it had been uh, prior to that. So. We think this again reinforces the positive outcome of the irrigation restrictions that we've implemented. But what you can see is this is 2020 and you can see that orange line, uh, the orange bar is 2020, that that line jumped up in 2020. Um, and so there's a couple things there. It was a very dry summer. Um, it was drier. It, it, we still used less water than we did in 2016 but we did jump up, you know, but it was a drier year than the other two years. And I guess the other thing that we want to point out is if you look at our non-watering days, that's the Monday, Thursday, Friday, um, you can see that the, the jump up was more substantial on our non-watering days. So there is some concern. You know, COVID was tough last year. It was a very, very, I don't know if anybody remembers, it was a very dry uh, May and a lot of people were home. And I think a lot of people did projects and it was so dry, they started, you know, they wanted to protect their investments, their projects. 
and you know probably got into some old habits. And so we did see what we think is a little bit of a reversion back to watering, you know, outside of that schedule. So in summary, you know, so what we have done, and I didn't really talk about tonight, we've implemented some additional modern reservoir management. So we're using computer models to project out what our reservoirs look like, the, uh, the uh, forecasting, what the likelihood of different levels are over the next nine months to a year. And uh, what we do is it allows us to go into restrictions sooner. I don't know how many of everybody remembers, but in 2016, we didn't really put in place restrictions or start talking about restriction till July and August is the first time we started asking people to make, you know, to, to reduce their water use. And in September, we ended up implementing the water ban. But last year, we started contacting, you know, sending out messaging in May and even in June because we had that advanced knowledge of, okay, the projections are indicating we have a high likelihood of getting into drought curve. So we're using that to try to get the message out sooner and start making those kinds of decisions easier. We think demand management has definitely helped. Like we said, we on the order of 200 million gallons of savings, but we are concerned that there might be some return of old habits in 2020 that we need to reinforce. So we are intending to come out with a, a strong communication program this spring to reinforce that the, the, the two day a week program and try to get back to the, 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 better, the better habits we had developed a couple of years ago. Uh, we have put additional capacity in place so that we have large, we have increased our interconnections inside uh, uh, Greenwich itself and to, you know, between Stanford and even from the Barge Reservoir. We're improving those, uh, we've already improved, uh, increased those capacities to make more water available. And there is additional projects in place in order to bring some additional capacity down to Greenwich and Stanford as well, just to reinforce the system so that if we did have a problem, we, we wouldn't, uh, we've got more capacity to offset some of those demands. And that's, that's, all I, that's all I had for tonight. I hope uh, I give you a quick little summary of the water system and where we are. That's fantastic, Jeff. Thank you so much. Um, so interesting to hear um, about the actual supply. And um, I know I have some questions about um, some of the, the changes that may be coming down the pike. Um, and now we're going to turn to Pat Sesto, whose department really has had a lot, a large part in helping to um, educate our, our residents about um, the importance of water conservation. And in fact, some of the benefits you can have with um, uh, to your lawns and gardens by um, reducing irrigation to two times a week. Um, so Pat uh, has been with our Greenwich Wetlands Agency um, as director for the town since 2015 and became the head of our town of Greenwich Department of Environmental Affairs in 2018. Um, she began her professional career with consulting firms where she worked with engineers, sanitarians, and landscape architects. And before she came to Greenwich, she was a director of environmental affairs for 23 years in Wilton and a past conservation commissioner in her hometown of Ridgefield. Um, additionally, Pat has the distinction of being uh, the gubernatorial appointee to represent Connecticut on the Interstate Environmental Commission. Um, and she's also been the past president of the Nor Norwalk River Valley Trail. Um, so thank you so much, Pat, for all you do for Greenwich and um, looking forward to hearing your presentation tonight. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, so tonight we are going to talk about regulations as they relate to water shortage or um, if they do their job, the lack thereof. Um, so within the town of Greenwich, we've got rules, regulations, and then ultimately it comes back to the individuals with personal responsibility. Jeff and um, John have done a wonderful job in laying out for us our groundwater and our surface water and gave us an, um, an understanding of how those things are important to our very fabric of potable water, as well as sustaining the natural resources around us. So Generally, I think people are sincere and they understand the value of water, but they don't always individually know how to protect it. Um, so we do have a number of sources in town for regulations to protect our water supply. And I understand tonight's conversation is basically about quantity, um, but I can't help myself. I've got to throw quality in there too. Um, no good having water if it's bad water, as Flint, Michigan. Um, so Water quantity, we've got regulations that talk about inland, uh, our inland wetlands and um, water courses regulations. 
We have a progressive stormwater management manual in the town. We have water use restrictions, um, not only those restrictions that uh, Jeff spoke about, but there's also a local ordinance that deals with private wells. And then the health department has its regulations relating to uh, wells. For water quality, basically the wetland regulations and our storm water management manual mostly deal with um, our quality issues. So why do we protect our wetlands? Um, for years, our country, decades, was raised to consider wetlands as wasteland. We had the Swamp Busters Act. Across the country, you were rewarded for reclaiming wetlands. Um, it's, it's a funny word to me be, to use for this. Reclaiming suggests that it was something better before, and now we fixed it by filling it or building on it or draining it and all the other things that we have manipulated our wetlands. We have learned the hard way, for sure, that when we uh, reclaim, bust our swamps and the other manipulations to our wetlands, we lose valuable uh, natural resource services. Our groundwater is recharged through wetlands. Um, when the groundwater is low, the water that comes into a, a wetland tends to percolate downward and keep our groundwater levels sustained. Um, when those groundwater levels are sustained, that water flows outward and then discharges into our water courses, which provides for base flow of those water courses, um, which keeps them running, A, and then it keeps um, them cool, which is important for uh, healthier um, aquatic organisms to, to live in those areas. Flood control. Wetlands, the, the best wetlands for flood control are the ones that are broad and flat, probably associated with a good sized river or water course. And when the water comes in, it um, resides there for a while. Uh, and that helps us in a number of ways. And then they cleanse pollutants. Wetlands are fabulous at this, although um, we can certainly overtax that resource um, as we have any number of times. Regulations as a whole are there to protect you, the individual, from the uninformed decisions um, of others. Water resources are shared resources, and we don't always know what the best decision is. So regulations draw our attention to that and let entities who do have a better understanding help individuals guide their decisions. So wetlands protect surface water. Um, Sedimentation erosion, so the flood amelioration, when water makes its way to these broad flat areas, um, the energy that is in that um, storm water, when they hit a broad flat area, that energy lessens and um, the erosive potential lessens and the damage that can be done as rough water flows through areas, wetlands do a terrific job in absorbing that potential. They also, um, stage the flood water. So waters will kind of sit back, chill out in our wetlands, and then over time will work their way down either through groundwater or out through a water course, which instead of having all the water coming at one time, it's metered out over time, which is less damaging to our landscape, be it a developed landscape or a natural landscape. Um, there is pollution reduction. If you think about the storms, that come through our summer months. We saw in those graphs, we've got some good ones that come through. Um, that water frequently is flowing off of our heated paved surfaces, our roofs. And if they were to go directly into water courses, that's a big um, input of warmed water, which doesn't hold as much oxygen, doesn't support the diversity of wildlife um, that we would like to see. But when it sits, takes some time out and literally chills out in the wetland, um, the impacts of thermal pollution are reduced. When that water is sitting in the wetland, it's intermingling with the soils, with the vegetation, and there's chemical reactions where the pollutants can be bound up in the soil or plants, taking it out of our water column. Um, and taking it for the parts that bind to soil and to plants keeps it from our groundwater table. And the solids, as I said earlier, the water comes in and relaxes. And when you take that energy out of the water, the sediments drop um, and they'll, that again helps keep our water courses um, clearer. And as we know, our water courses are the ones that feed our reservoirs. So to the extent that the surrounding landscape can 
retain the pollutants. It's better for our groundwater, which we stick our, um, drill our wells into, and it keeps that much more pollutants from entering our reservoirs. Um, as John uh, spoke of earlier, most of the streams in our streams and water courses in this part of the country are gaining streams in that the high water table is discharging into the water course, but we do have some streams that were um, the, the groundwater is pulling from um, our streams. And then there are times when the water level, the groundwater level gets so low that there's actually a separation between the two. Um, that illustration is helpful when you think about our wells that we are drilling into the surface of our earth. Um, wells will be our more shallow wells around here or 100 feet or so. And then they go on up to several hundred feet. And if you're in a really tough way, they can you know, be 800,000 feet deep. Um, but mostly we are blessed with an enormous amount of groundwater that we don't see those things happen. I think in my 30 something years, there's only been two properties I know of where um, they could not get a minimum of 10 gallons per minute. So it's pretty extraordinary. But um, we do draw, our personal wells do draw directly from that groundwater. So ensuring the quality of water that percolates through our ground and, and consists of our groundwater that we then pull out and utilize, ensuring that that is clean is vitally important. Our wetlands do a, a Big job it, toward that end. Um, I think I forget if it was John or Jeff, probably John that spoke of where you have major drawdowns of our water table from um, irrigation wells. We don't have as much agricultural around here. Um, so that's not one of our major drawdowns. Um, we actually heard from Jeff before we went on that our golf courses don't draw down quite as much as we all think they do. They're quite judicious in the amount of water they pull um, but I have seen applications that come through where um, somebody, I think this would probably be one of the top one percenters that Jeff spoke of, where there was a six acre property who was looking to drill wells to fully irrigate that six acres. So there is a, a point in which the individual decisions on a property affect the water table and people beyond uh, their own property boundaries. So that's why the regulations exist to ensure that the personal decisions aren't negatively impacting those beyond. Um, I'll say for me, my personal experience back in 2016, I would have what I would consider a shallow well that it's just over a hundred feet. Um, it went dry five times during the fall of 2016. Um, so we have to be careful. These uh, threats are real. We also spoke a bit about um, Watershed. So we get why we regulate wetlands in the context of preserving our groundwater and having our surface water uh, renovated and um, our groundwater recharged by protecting those wetlands. But stormwater is another big factor. Um, and I think it's EPA considers stormwater runoff the largest pollutant uh, in the United States. Um, this is a, a little diagram of a watershed. So if you look at the outer boundaries of this little uh, landscape area, those are the tops of hills or mountains. And you can see everything that falls to the inside slowly accumulates and works its way down to the low point here in the little village center. So all of the decisions that are made throughout this watershed are reflected in the stormwater that passes over and through it. That's why we regulated. Stormwater management, I just gotta make us go away because I can't see what I'm reading here. Um, stormwater management manual is a recognition that the individual um, decisions that property owners make necessarily collect and cause headaches um, for others. Now this is actually a, um, this is from Hurricane Irene in Old Greenwich. Um, which I'm sure a number of people who are viewing this tonight have um, distinct memories of. So the goal of the stormwater management manual is to have each expansion of impervious coverage on each property be responsible for its own runoff. When we fail to mimic the water cycle, which is precipitation down, contributes to groundwater, some runoff, some evapotranspiration, um, that collectively, failing to mimic that, collectively causes problems to others. 
So our individual decisions, again, collectively impacting somebody else. That's why we regulate. Infiltration is um, a key point in what our manual demands. And it demands this for several reasons. Um, not only um, water quantity, but water quality. Infiltration um, reduces our pollutants associated with our runoff. Um, the slide to the left, this is one of the always a favorite when you're watering your driveway, it's not gonna grow. Um, keeping irrigation water on your irrigation target. When we have, be it irrigation water or storm water runoff, hit these impervious surfaces. As I said, the pollutants, all the decisions within the watershed collect. And you can see at the bottom right-hand side of that screen is a catch basin. Catch basins invariably connect to other pipes, which might connect to another pipe, work your way through the system long or short, it's going into a water course or a wetland. Um, we can see those drain to the sound on catch basins and you'll be surprised how far you are from the sound and that connects to the sound or for more inland properties, it connects to a wetland or water course. Um, our infrastructure has made these direct connections which makes it imperative for us to manage our stormwater. Um, you can do it to the slide to the right is a rain garden. So it, managing our stormwater doesn't have to be a negative aesthetic. It can really be quite beautiful part of our landscape um, in which we are being responsible in the stormwater, which we generate on our own property and try to work it back into the ground to keep the groundwater level up and the water quality level up. Um, the or local ordinance that Greenwich has, um, again, we're front runners on this one. Um, I'll say kudos to Greenwich for having implemented this. This precedes me, so I take absolutely no credit, but I'm thrilled that we have it. Um, many times we get into these drought situations like we did last year, back in 2016, and people on wells are like, my well, my problem, and we know that's not the case. Um, because Greenwich has an ordinance affecting uh, individual wells, we can look at things holistically, such as groundwater levels um, forecast and complement what Aquarian is seeing in their surface water and work towards um, helping our groundwater levels stay high too. The two day a week um, limitation on irrigation, that is permanent. I still get even, you know, how many years later people say, oh, is the ban still on this year? And like, no, this is permanent. This is the way we live now. It is the norm and I have had no complaints about people who have um, an established lawn saying the two day a week thing's not working for me. My lawn still can't survive. We can. I think in 2016, Jeff, there was a woman from Texas who said, you know, if Texans can do well and thrive with irrigation two days a week, Connecticut sure can. Um, so then we also, the local ordinance allows us to institute further restrictions during drought construction. And those, um, again, complement the ones that just spoke about with Aquarian. So we are on the same page with how we should use this um, precious commodity, um, our potable commodity. Um, and again, this local ordinance goes back to protecting a common resource, our water. And if there is no regulation, you are on your own to make sustainable choices. So in the quality realm of making choices and remember that quality of the surface water in your backyard contributes to the quality of the stream that that goes into and then so on and so on. Maybe it goes to the reservoir, maybe it goes to the sound, maybe it goes to your pond. Dog waste, pound of poop per dog per day. On average, big dogs, little dogs, it changes. So if we have 16,000 families in Greenwich and we have an average based on licensing of 1.6 dogs on average, it's 25,000 pounds of poop every day. We don't all do a great job of picking it up. So when it poops, then it rains, the bacteria, the nitrogen wash across the landscape. Go to the car wash. Um, gone should be the days where we are soaping up our cars in the driveway. Uh, if we can afford it, uh, if it's within our means, go to the car wash. Um, most of our driveways either drain to a nice drain in our private driveway 
or drain out to the road where it hits a catch basin. But again, all the catch basins eventually go to a wetland or a water course. Riparian buffers, bottom left. Um, protecting our water courses from the things that occur on our residential and our suburban landscapes um, just a simple buffer, 10, 15 feet wide minimum, does a whole lot to help strain out some of those pollutants, supports increased infiltration, and protects that water resource that we're depending on for so much else. The biggest one, I hope our big takeaway today, have less lawn. Um, at a rate of one pound of nitrogen per acre in a given year, Greenwich has 630 um, acres of lawn. So if we're equally putting down nitrogen across all those acres of lawn, that means we're putting down 630,000 pounds of nitrogen per application. So if you're spraying in the fall, it's times two. In the summer, 50% of the water demand is for irrigation. Um, that is our potable water that we are sprinkling out onto our lawns, our potable water. And Jeff has made it clear we're doing much better and that's terrific news. Think, think about potable water on our lawns and can you do less? Do you need as much lawn? Um, the options to lawn are wonderful. If um, meadows with native vegetation and deep roots are drought resistant, they are far less maintenance than a lawn is. You don't have to mow them every week, I can tell you that. Um, and you'll love the sound of, it's nothing quite as good as summer evenings with a, a meadow and hearing the life in it. And then you stand out in the middle of a lawn, you don't hear it. They just don't support um, the wildlife the way a diverse um, landscape would. And diversity of plants is beautiful. We did, we came here from Europe with this aesthetic for lawn. We don't live in the climate of England. Um, so lawns are a big draw for us. Um, so let's rethink what is beautiful and work towards that and be beautiful inside and out. And there are a bunch of other easy options. Have less impervious pavement um, associated with your properties. Either use pavers or um, pervious pavements, which could be porous asphalt, pervious concrete. There's so many choices have smaller paved areas. Um, I appreciate people who entertain and like to have um, their guests be able to park easily. Um, you can have areas that are lawned, but um, have a grid underneath them so that on any given day when you're not entertaining, you don't need that many cars. You don't have to have pavement um, just out there. You can have lawn with a grid underneath it that would support the cars on the day you do have it. Disconnect your downspouts. Um, this one, the third one uh, from the left, that's a downspout going into an elevated garden area. There's so many options where your downspout can go to a garden instead of into that um, PVC pipe that works its way out to some point in your yard or to a wetland in a stream. It's not healthy. There's a lot of pollutants that come off of our roofs and it's really important to take that roof runoff and get it back into the ground. Maintain and or plant more trees. Evapotranspiration aside, <laughs> they are still great. Um, trees help um, keep our soil healthy and aerated. Um, the roots break through things along with all kinds of other organisms that keep our soil um, more porous, which is just um, the ultimate goal when you talk about promoting infiltration. Use a rain barrel. It's little, but can you imagine if we just multiplied that out the way we multiply out dog poop, what a difference it could make. Um, the little rain garden, rain barrel that can order um, small sections of a garden or your herbs or um, any other special little area that you might have. Um, aerate and compost lawn to increase infiltration. Um, again, the, the runoff that we get, whether it's from steep slopes, compacted soils, um, lawn versus um, more interesting vegetative cover, um, if you do have a lawn, make sure that it's aerated so that the infiltration um, is at its peak. The roots of the grass are deeper, therefore then you don't have to water them as much. It'll be great. And then another easy option that um, didn't make it on here is definitely the smart irrigation systems. Um, irrigation that is tripped 
when the um, the rainfall amounts demand it. So it's not just two days a week, it's two days a week as needed. Um, the smart systems I think are pretty prevalent nowadays um, and it seems like just an obvious thing to do. Um, so I would think that that's another easy option for people when they're replacing or installing a system. So thank you. Um, I hope everybody has a better feeling for groundwater and our surface water and our, the potability of both of those things. And it's a shared resource. And, and I hope there's a greater appreciation that regulations aren't just there to, to torture, but they're actually meant to preserve the things that are important to us. Thank you. Pat, that was terrific and really highlighted the connections of, of having kind of one shared system with water and, um, and also its whole impact on the cycle, how our soil impacts our water, the, the runoff and infiltration. Um, so, I, and I love the practical tips uh, for improving our, um, what's easy steps we can all take to make a real difference. So thank you for that. Um, so we have a, a good, little chunk of questions and would welcome um, that others add more as well um, by putting them in the Q&A, not the chat. Um, but um, I'll start off with our first question uh, to the panel. Uh, approximately what percentage of pre precipitation um, is lost to runoff in Greenwich? You want me to address that one? I, I could probably, I mean, if you look back on my presentation, so um, I guess it depends on which way you look at it, but it's a roughly, the number is roughly 50%. So about 50% of our rainfall is evapotranspiration and about 50% is, is ends up in the, uh, ends, ends up, up in a river. Okay, terrific. Um, our next question is, uh, how does the water supply in Connecticut compare to that um, of other states? And is our environmental approach different? So um, I'll I'll try to answer from the water. You know, water um, John, if you have anything you want to chime in you know, after I finish, feel free. Um, it's kind of, you know I think you know it's a northeast water system. You know it was designed you know around you know primarily in New York City, North New Jersey, uh, the New York area are designed around reservoir systems, the surface water systems. Um, you know and they were really designed around the industrial you know to serve the industrial needs. Uh, from earlier in the century, and that's what's still in place. In some cases, uh, the you know, like in the Bridgeport area, there's a lot of excess capacity because a lot of the industrial needs have gone away. Uh, but you know, down here in an area like Greenwich, you you know, the residential demand has gone up, and you have that same thing. I, I'm originally from New Jersey. New Jersey has a similar thing. Newark, you know, Jersey City have plenty of water. But the areas or the residential residences have been are a lot more residential has gone in. Uh, the um, they're a little more stressed or you know, a little more you know, up to their design capacity. So I think it's comparable. Um, the one thing I would think I uh, I was a little surprised here in Connecticut. I don't I didn't realize I, I'm here six years now. Connecticut's a little more spread out than I expected. You know, in New Jersey, there's what we more interconnections. Like there's more of an ability. If one water system has trouble to move water from another water system, so like a, an MDC that has lots of water up in Hartford, uh, in New Jersey, there's there's a little more of an ability to move water from northern part of the state to the central part of the state, or even down a lot uh, to give them offset to the coast. So I think that's probably, and I think it's just the distance. There's just bigger gaps between the cent the city centers here than there are in New Jersey. Interesting. And um, while you're uh, speaking, Jeff, uh, another question, um, you were talking about the impact of um, the industrialized area previously and how the system had been set up for that. Um, in Greenwich is, uh, you know, we really do talk about how residences use it and that seasonal irrigation use that skyrockets. But could you also comment, because um, there, there's not a lot of information on commercial or um, what I know we don't have a lot of industry in Greenwich, but um, what about the yeah. commercial users um, and are they heavy in Greenwich? And does that also mm -hmm. add to the demand? For example, we have a hospital and so obviously they need a lot of water. Um, yeah. And uh, does that, you know, we have a reputation of being water hogs in Greenwich and, and uh, you know, <laughs> I'm looking for other reasons why we might, we might be such big water um, consumptions other than our, our, our penchant for emerald lawns, so. 
So um, in Greenwich, uh, two thirds of all the water use in Greenwich is residential. Okay. Um, you know, uh, uh, in what we call industrial, uh, commercial industrial, only makes up eighteen percent of the water use okay. in Greenwich, and multifamily makes up about ten percent. So the, by far the largest portion of the water use in Greenwich, and what really and what Pat mentioned before, it's the summer demands. Or, the summer demands that the commercial, like the hospital may have high demands, but they don't go up as much in the summertime. You know, they don't, you don't, you don't get a kick up. It's kind of a flat, a more consistent, even the office buildings, their demands may go up some in the summertime, but they don't go up nearly as dramatically. You know, so there, like in the case of the residential in Greenwich, it's more than double the water use. The winter, you know, when you look at the summer demand, it's more than double the water use of the winter demand. In the industrial, it's only about 26, 30 percent more. So it's, it, it upticks in the summertime because of those outside uses, but it doesn't increase nearly to the level that the residential does. Great answer. Um, and Jeff, one one last one. I'll I'll pull from our list here of questions uh, while we have you. Um, <laughs> and what percentage of uh, what percentage of Greenwich is served by Aquarian? I know obviously we've got a lot of um, backcountry wells. Um, but is there a number that yeah. you could have for us on what percentage generally of households? I may know it better. I don't know. We serve all the way up to the merit. So uh, basically across the merit is we, we don't serve across the merit. Um, okay. So I would guess that's probably under what, that's probably what, 85, 90% of the residents I would think we it serve. Be, Pat, would you agree? I'd, I'd seen a presentation before, maybe from uh, right before uh, Pat uh, headed the, our department and it was like 80, 88%, something like that. And I was curious if that was still a, a, a relevant number. I think, that's, I think that's still a relevant number, yep. Okay. Yeah, there's not been expansion um, of the public water service in a, a measurable way against the, the amount of development we already have that's served by public water. So that number probably won't change in, in a big way. Terrific. Um, and we had a question regarding the demand commuter, computer models um, and whether they take into account new construction, in fact. Yeah, so we were required to do uh, master plans uh, as part of our permitting with the state. And they, they lay out like a 20-year time frame. So we take into account population increases. We look at zoning. We talk to each town, the planning departments in each town, and get an estimate of what they anticipate development-wise going forward. And we apply those. And then our plans include meeting those demands in the future. But nationally and even locally, our de the, the demands, demands nationally are going down uh, because of all the um, the improved, um, well, by per, per person, demands are going down and the Connecticut population is not going up dramatically. So really our demands should be dropping because you know, improved plumbing fixtures, reduced water use in showers and toilets and all that type of stuff. Everything's getting more efficient. So, but really our demands are about flat because what's happening is more and more irrigation is going in and it's offsetting some of that benefit we're getting from the the plumbing improvements. Oh, interesting. Um, and speaking of which, a uh, question from, um, from Ms. Sesto, are there plans to require new construction, especially multi-dwelling units to include groundwater systems to reduce the use of potable water to flush toilets and do laundry and such? So those regulations actually come from the state health department. So it's um, not a decision that we are able to make locally. Ah. No. Um, and you may have already spoken to this, but how does Greenwich rank with the rest of the state in water use per capita if that's how it's measured? I'll, I'll put that to Jeff. They're the highest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, Southwest Fairfield. Yeah, so uh, Greenwich is of the towns we serve 70, I think it's 70 one town, 74 towns in the state of Connecticut. And um, the Connecticut, Southwest Fairfield County, I mean, Connecticut is the highest, but you know, New Darien is high, New Canaan is high, Westport's high. Um, you know, it, it's where, you know, uh, 
it, you know, that, that, end, that end of the state is our highest users and Grants is our highest users. I have a frame of reference on that. Um, in the summer months, so Greenwich is um, half the population of Stanford, but uses twice the water of Stanford. Amazing. Yeah, I was going to I was going to add I I remember uh, analyzing those water use data from back around 2000 and things may have changed a lot. But what was kind of shocking to me was as lot size went up, the the water use went up dramatically with that, whereas, you know, you had the small lot size, you had kind of sort of more typical kind of state of Connecticut water use. But as you go up in in lot size, there definitely was, uh, you know, some big increases um, in the in the water used. And I also saw what what Jeff was talking about, that increase in the summer demand and looking at at their I guess the, the data I had came from you back in back in that time period. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, so and even one third of Greenwich is the land cover type is lawn. One third. And one third is developed. And then the, the rest is everything else. It's a lot. So um, I have someone else put in um, a question about why is the North Street reservoir empty? And I thought, um, Jeff, oh. and I warned you about this, that actually I think it would be really helpful to hear about um, the South, the South, Southwest Regional Pipeline. Um, okay. and I, I don't know. In summary, I would say that, you know, that maybe people don't realize that uh, with climate change that we're looking to, correct me if I'm wrong, but to divert water through a permit that is current, that Aquarian currently is doing, um, to divert water from, as you said, the Bridgeport system has um, excess water. And maybe you could explain a little bit about um, the, what people view as reservoirs here in Greenwich and if that's really a holding capacity okay. and all that. Yeah. So um, I, you know, I, I see a couple questions on here about, you know, what the reservoir stats, so I'll hit those and I'll get to the, the Southeast Regional Pipeline. Um, so the Grand system, the way the Grand system works is um, the barge reservoir is in Stamford um, and it, it collects water there. And then we pump from that reservoir to what we call the Rockwood Reservoir, which is the reservoir that's along North Avenue there. The reason it's empty right now is there was a, um, a causeway, the roadway that crosses in the middle of the reservoir. Uh, last year, a culvert collapsed. So working with the town, they're repairing that culvert right now. So they asked us, we had drained it. It had gotten down in the fall anyway, but then they asked us to keep it dry so they could do that repair. They now are very close to finishing the repair and we've started filling it now. So if you look at our reservoir curves, they're lower than they normally would be for this time of year but the barge reservoir is still spilling and we're pumping water and we won't, we'll be able to fill the, that reservoir. We expect it to be full by, you know, definitely by the end of April. And then we top off and then our reservoir should be spilling in Greenwich. Uh, we don't expect any reason why they won't spill before, uh, you, know, you know, by May 1st or, you know, uh, in Greenwich. And we're using reservoir models for that. And it's giving, you know, it's a very high, it's like over 95% likelihood that they're gonna, they're gonna spill this year. And the reason is, is our, the, the, the reservoirs in um, uh, Greenwich have very large, fairly large watersheds for the amount of water they store. So generally there's a last village. So, um, so even though we're a little late filling Rockwood, there should be plenty of water to continue filling Rockwood. Um, and then talking about the Southwest Fairfield, uh, the, the Southwest Regional Pipeline, so what we do bring, we've been bringing water down a regional pipeline for decades. Uh, there's been, when it was the Greenwich Water Company and the Stanford Water Company in New Canaan, uh, there was a need and there was a pipeline that was built even at that time to help those water systems by bringing water down. But it was really designed for the, the needs at that time. And it hasn't been increased. It's, uh, so, you know, the demands have gone up in those towns over the last 20 years. So we are in looking you know, for an increase uh, to increase that. And just that we have the stream flow requirements that are coming. They're going to require us to release more water from our reservoirs. So we'll also have less water in our reservoirs in addition to the additional demands. So we are pursuing a permit right now to, uh, you know, to increase the, uh, the permit of how much water we can bring down from the Bridgeport system. And looking at the Bridgeport system has a lot of excess capacity. The right Bridgeport system was really built to serve all that industry that was in Bridgeport for all those years. And there's a, you know, a, a lot of excess capacity there. So we're trying to take advantage of it 
to serve you know the uh, the state as best we can. Can you can you explain a little bit more about the stream flow requirements? Because a lot of people, um, especially, it's interesting that John um, talked about the Mill Creek area at the very beginning. Um, running dry, you know, there's a lot of people in Fairfield uh, who are concerned about um, their reservoirs and, and streams not already getting enough. And while it's great that maybe you said approximately eight years from now that there would be a requirement for more downstream, um, it's scary to them um, to, to feel like we're diverting water, you know, from those areas already, um, you know, so that we can irrigate our lawns during the summer here in Greenwich um, to, if, if we had to take a negative view on that. And, you know, is there a way to kind of tell them that we, or to increase the flow and, and allay their concerns? You talk about an excess, maybe we could describe that more. Yeah, so, um, so what there is is um, there's, a, there's a set of rules called the stream flow regulations. And it requires everybody who has a, a reservoir and a dam uh, to release more water in the future. And it's, it's, the timing is based on when some studies were completed. So 10 years from the time that the, the work is completed, you have to start doing that. So we're in the, we, when, uh, we estimate we have about uh, approximately 100 million gallons of safe, what we call safe field availability of everyday water demand in our reservoirs. We're gonna go down to 85 million gallons a day after the stream flow regulations take effect. We're gonna lose about 15% of our level <laughs> safe field uh, because we're going to be releasing more water from our reservoirs, and I, you know, I, I guess the um, I understand the concerns in Fairfield, um, and I, John's probably more apt to talking about this than I am. But um, you know, the reservoirs do release water. We do release water from our reservoirs currently to the streams in in Easton as well as in Fairfield, and I think if you look historically, if the reservoirs weren't there. The stream flows would actually be lower in the summer than they are with our releases because we do maintain a minimum release and if the reservoirs weren't there and you had very dry summers there would be even less water so we maintain a level of release in the streams that that wouldn't be there naturally and that's in our calculations in our management of of the reservoir system and so as part of the you know that that's also taken into account in these calculations and developing these long-term plans so we have this release requirement and also meeting the demand, the customer demands as well. well uh, John, do you have anything you want to add to that? You probably you may have a little. Oh. Yeah, well, no, I was just gonna, I was just gonna add the the Mill River I was showing is actually in the New Haven area. So, but it <laughs> is in the it is a stream that's in the Regional Water Authority system. So it's it's uh, but it's a little bit different system without much reservoir and there's groundwater and then the you know sort of the end of the line right right before uh, you get to uh, New Haven there's like Lake Whitney and that flows into Lake Whitney. So. Um, you know, so it's, it, and there really isn't much uh, ability to control the water that's coming down that particular stream, just because there's not a lot of storage there. Well, the other question I had was, um, if, okay. if there's, so we have a good flow coming down from the bar, barge reservoir, um, to Greenwich, yep. but also don't you have to maintain a certain amount of water for the reservoir and the water treatment plant? plant in Greenwich and to maintain kind of a healthy um, aquatic system um, for water for water quality. And is that something, and I don't think people realize like they, these are small, what is actually in Greenwich is not, they're not that large, right? Um, they can't be, uh, I mean, we're holding from a holding perspective. Yeah, the, yeah they're, 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 on, they're on, the, on the size of reservoir, you know, reservoirs are on the small side of reservoirs in, in the water industry. Um, you know, the, our Saugatuck Reservoir is you know, multiple times larger than the Greenwich Reservoirs. And if you go out west, you know, the, the ones out west, they, you know, they, they hold, you know, years of water. You know, they, if they can, even MDC, I think they say they can hold up to four years of their demands in their reservoirs. So uh, the Greenwich Stanford Reservoirs are, they were built at the time they were built uh, with the limitations of the of the valleys and the land around them at the time, but they're they're small in comparison to most reservoirs in the industry. And so we do manage them. I mean, so we have to, so there's that combination like you're talking about. We know we have a release requirement. We know we we know what the demands are gonna be and we have to maintain water in the reservoir, uh, to, in the reservoir to go through our plants to produce, to meet the demands. 
and then there is uh, there is an aquatic aspect of the reservoirs as well so there's always some level of water we want to maintain in the reservoirs as well uh, the other question we had was um, Greenwich in, in your in some of the Aquarian notes that we've seen over time we've talked about um, the transfer of water from um, the Greenwich treatment plant as part of the kind of regional pipeline um, to the Suez company that supplies Port Chester and um, uh, Rye mm -hmm. Brook and Rye through longstanding agreements. Uh, and did you want to touch on that? Because what, what, what one of my questions was, they don't seem to be conserving, having the same type of conservation <laughs> message. <laughs> we kind of checked on some gotcha. of the towns in, in uh, next door and they were like, um, you know, they, they weren't concerned about irrigation. I don't, they have a two, I don't know that they have a two day ban and was just curious no, about that because we have made a real impact here in Greenwich. And I know that yeah. it's, it's not our water um, in that it's shared between New York State and um, Connecticut, but it is kind of, it does kind of make us wonder a little bit about it. Um, yep. Yeah, so the, um, uh, in 2016, we, we ran into this quite a bit. You know, we, you know, um, they, they've got different rules in New York. It required, you know, because it's connected to the New York system, in order to put restrictions in place, they had to go all the way, they were required to go all the way to the State Department of Health to, um, to impose the two-day week restrictions. They weren't allowed to do it locally. So there's a little different rules in New York. Um, I, you know, what, you know, and I guess just to quickly summarize, you know, tell a quick story about the overall. So the reservoir was built when there was Port Chester Water Company and Greenwich Water Company. There were two water companies and they went, they got together to build the Barge Reservoir, which is in Stanford. Um, it extends into New York. About, about half of the water body is in New York State. If you go up, it extends past the state border. And most of the watershed is actually in New York. Most of the water that gets into the Barge Reservoir is actually uh, runoff from the state of New York. Um, in addition to that, uh, so we own the land that's in Stanford, but the Port Chester Water Company, or now Suez, owns the land that's in, the, in, in New York. So it's a joint arrangement, a joint, a joint operation, joint ownership. So as part of that agreement, when it was built, they were entitled to 5 million gallons a day of water. So that's their contractual right to have access to that water. So that's what we, we provide them on an average, base, average day basis is 5 million gallons a day. We have had conversations with them and let them know what we're doing in Greenwich. But as long as they don't exceed that 5 million gallons a day, we don't really have a contractual capability to tell them they can't, what they can do with that 5 million gallons a day. Right, and John, would you say that uh, looking at your forecasting that uh, there won't be any interstate wars the way there is out West with um, the demand for <laughs> water between states and starting to be proprietary about your watersheds? Um, I, I mean, it does seem to, I, we have heard that climate change means that we are gonna get a, you know, we are net positive on the water side, but can we depend upon that? That's a good question. I think I think we can depend upon our ample water, but we may need to figure out better ways of kind of holding on to it when we get it. And you know, a lot of what Jeff is talking about is you know having those systems that capture the water when it's available and being able to store it. Um, you know, some of the things we I mentioned about just more variability is something that seems to be coming. Um, you know, whether we get extreme rainfalls on one end or whether we just get you know, we've had a few of these droughts you can go back and look, I can think of, you know, 1995, 2002, um, you know, we had uh, with 2016, there's been a couple other ones in there too, of some kind of dry years, we, we seem to be getting a drier spring. So um, I don't think we'll have those kind of issues, oh, oh, you know, as long as we have the water available, I hope we won't be arguing amongst states. I've been doing work for our California office and, uh, you know, we're, we're really blessed here as far as water goes in this part of the country. Um, I was just reviewing a report today of uh, the water supply for Fort Irwin in the Mojave Desert. And, uh, you know, their, their largest source of recharge is recycled wastewater in that area, too, where you get, you know, if you, you might get two, three or four inches of rainfall a year. 
and they're trying to basically mining old water in these desert basins. So, um, you know, in a way we've, we've, we're doing pretty well in this part of the country. And I often wonder um, when I sit on the interagency drought work group uh, here in Connecticut and, you know, I've brought up the issue, um, you know, we have development patterns over time, but maybe it will be our water that will turn the country more in this direction again at some point with our development or looking for our um, our ample water as being something that's pretty important. Right, right, excellent. Um, I have a rather complicated question. I don't even know if I can read all of it, but um, it was uh, directed toward Mr. Um, Mr. Ulrich and whether uh, the implementation of peak, Aquarian peak water surcharges uh, might come into effect. It says the official Aquarian 2021 Greenwich Re system reservoir status shows 84.7% capacity as of March 9th, 2021. This is lower than the 20 year average, lower than 2016 drought year and the past 2020 season, i.e. your slide number nine. So if the current rather dry weather continues through April, mid-May, we may have a new low record. Is Aquarian thinking of adding some sort of drought special surcharge for this peak usage period from July to September? Um, however limited to only those who actually use water in excessive ways or over normal average residential uses. Um, well, I'll, yeah. I'll do my it best. It goes on, it goes on, but uh, on, it goes on, um, So, you know, from a reservoir perspective, like I said, we are lower than normal, but a lot, some of that is related to the Rockwood Reservoir being empty right now. Uh, and we expect that we will be able to, you know, spill the reservoirs will be spilling by May 1st. That's our expectation based on our reservoir models uh, that, that we that we use um, about uh, increasing the rates or having a higher rate. So we have a tariff. Um, so we have to we have, what we do is rate cases. We have to go into Pura, the Public Utility Regulatory Authority, and you have to go in and get your rates approved. We haven't been in to get our rates approved for a while. And right now, our rates are a flat rate. Everybody pretty much pays the same cost for every gallon of water. Our intent is when we go in for the next rate case is that we will be putting in some kind of um, in, what they call an increasing block rate. As you use more water, you'll pay more for it. Uh, but we have to go through a rate case in order to implement that. We can't implement that without, uh, without getting that approved by our regulatory authority. So that's interesting. So, so that it wouldn't be apply. this year. So we. So it, it could apply to. But we, we the, do intend you know, the one percent <laughs> of of you know the, the high high. Yeah, well that's. Yeah, so that's I mean that's if you uh, actually there was a conference today I was on earlier today with the the Connecticut American Water Works Association had a a rate and water conservation conference and you know and, that, and the discussions around the increasing increasing block rate most places you know, uh, particularly they're trying to conserve water or have an interest in conserving water, have already implemented an increasing block rate. So you have a base rate you know, up to what you think is a, a reasonable amount of water for a single house to use. And then if you get 50% above that, the rate goes up and then it goes up and then it goes up. So the people that are using those very, very high levels of water use uh, have a financial. And it, it's really the fairest way to do it because the reason we're having to do some of these additional this additional work is to, you know, um, you know, is to satisfy those high demands at times. And so those people are really the ones should be paying for that, that the cost of that infrastructure and the cost of putting those improvements in place. Um, I did see a little bit in there too about the, um, I, I guess the big, from my perspective, the conversation, is, I call it a pro, finding the most appropriate balance of water uses. Like John mentioned in his presentation, there's a lot of needs for water. You know, there's there's fire protection, there's waste disposal, the showering, there's you know dishwashers, everything. And I do think you know I, uh, I do think people like it. You know, there's some aspect of a green lawn and a pool that people like and can enjoy. It's just you know what's finding the right balance of those uses. And I think what I showed on the one graph is there's a section, there's a group of our customers that are using it way out of excess, you know, in an excess, and we just need to get that group. Most of the customers are very, you know, very water conscious and probably using it appropriately. It's just a small group of our customers that we have to try to 
uh, modify their behavior and manage their demand a little bit, and it'll, it'll really you know, change, change the, the equation for everybody. It, it, yeah, and speaking of which, uh, one question was, how can we encourage people to embrace pollinator pathway of landscaping um, to reverse the water usage ratio, um, you know, so we can do better with our water conservation and look, you know, nice at the same time? And, uh, you know, how do we, how do we uh, embrace the uh, no lawn garden and that kind of thing? Um, Pat, have you found best practices for that. I know our wonderful Alex Mock works so hard on pollinator pathways. Yes. Uh, yeah, so Alex, uh, the Conservation Commission and through Alex's work, we are um, having pollinator pathways throughout town. And my hope is that, um, you know, lead by example and people will um, see that these are really lovely places. They're not um, scrubby and unkempt looking, that they look like they have intention and they are attractive. Um, I would love to see any garden club people out there. When we have um, the garden tours, let's highlight the homes that have less lawn. And it's not no lawn, it's less lawn. Um, how do some lawn complement other aesthetically pleasing landscape styles? Um, let's highlight those and you know sort of change our perception of what, you know, expand our perception of what's beautiful in our residential landscape. Um, and just to address someone who did, I think I know the answer to this, but is Aquarian thinking of converting ocean seawater on into fresh water? Israel knows how to do that very well. The city of San Diego invested in a 3 billion facility for its local usage. I know it's um, very energy intensive, but uh, uh, someone asked that question. Uh, there's two, two issues we have. So Connecticut, you know, one thing that Connecticut does have, there's only two states in the country that have a requirement that uh, drinking water supplies have to come from what they call class one water bodies, uh, which means they can't have any point discharges to them, no wastewater treatment plants or anything else upstream of them. New Jersey, where I'm from, there are lots of water treatment plants downstream of wastewater treatment plants. So you're, you know, the wastewater is going into the stream or the river and the downstream, they're taking it out with a water treatment plant and treating it and, and you know, sending it to drink water. That does not happen in Connecticut. It's a, uh, the rules don't allow that. And since Long Island Sound receives wastewater, there would have to be a really, really significant change to the rules of, of water use for us to even consider it as an option. In addition to that, if you look at the water cost options, the cost to develop that, the other options that we have available to us are a lot cheaper than to do the CD cell. And the environmental impact on D cell is pretty significant. The waste that's generated, the energy usage, it's, uh, it, you, you, we would only use it in a, a very, very extreme circumstance. And we think there are other options that are more appropriate. Yeah, I hear the salt is really what to do with the excess salinity is, is very difficult, where to put it and, and how to deal with it um, on a large scale yeah. basis. So um, interesting. Yeah. And what else have we not asked? And then I had a question about, you know, I mentioned to you before when we were having a conversation about um, the state water plan and what Aquarian is, is preparing for that. And for those that, um, that don't know, uh, the state has looked at, for years at putting some, some type of um, kind of memorandum of understanding on, on our water uh, in Connecticut. And when you move in, you know, do you own the water underneath your, your land? Is it your water or can someone, you know, as Pat was referring to, you know, wells can make a big difference um, uh, between one's, what you're drawing out of your property and the impact on others. And, you know, in that it's a shared resource, um, you know, this water plan's rather exciting. You know, some of us looked at the issue of San Jose Water, uh, the San Jose Water Company looked to go buy, um, and I think they completed the transaction, one of the water companies that was yep. available for sale Connecticut in Connecticut. Water. And I know having having um, contacts out in California and, and the Bay Area, I was like, oh, oh, <laughs> um, they, they've got the message about our, our rainfall. Um, and so it is, it is an interesting question. And then, you know, you do have, you know, the Nestle Waters and people bottling water and, and using and selling that. 
Um, and maybe that's not an issue for us, but for those of us that are trying to see that we're doing the right thing from a sustainability perspective, um, you know, you wonder about that, that and wanting a water plan. And it was a significant hurdle to kind of put it water in the public trust and, and who owns your water. Uh, I find the whole issue of water rights really interesting. So just curious uh, what, what your take is on that and what Aquarian thinks. Um, yeah, we're, we, you know, like we discussed before, uh, uh, that they didn't, it is in a water plan now, you know, that, that it's a, the water trust. We don't really understand the full implications of that yet. I think it, it's still some, um, even as recently as 2016, when, um, when there were, yeah, you know, I don't want to say this now, but there were people going in. So people didn't like our water restrictions. So they were going to the towns and drilling wells on their property so that they could irrigate outside the schedule because they didn't want to comply with the two day week. And a couple of the towns tried to stop the people and said, no, no, we're not gonna authorize permits for drilling your own irrigation well uh, right now during the drought. And it went all the way to the you know, state attorney general's office and they said, no, we don't, you don't have the right to stop someone from drilling a well on their, their own property. So there's still a lot of discussion, a lot of debate you know, that's gonna to have to take there. there is, I think you all, anybody that's been involved in politics, there's a very strong sense of home rule in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I should be able to do on my property what I want to do with my piece of property. So it's, it's, um, I, I don't know if we know the full implications of that, but it's, it's going to be a big, a big, big jump before I think people are, you know, the politicians are going to be in a place to say someone can't put a well on their own property to, to, to supply their own property. So it's, but we'll, we'll see what the outcome is, but it's the wording's there. Now it's just a matter of, <laughs> Where that where that where that goes? <laughs> well, yeah, and it and if and if climate change uh, continues to bless us with a, a decent amount of water, it may not have to really be looked at. But um, but you you just never know. That was kind of a surprising thing to me when a California water company is looking to <laughs> diversify here. Pat, I had a follow up question on understanding to what extent. Um, do you control or can you control or institute uh, the same things on, you touched, touched upon it a little bit, but I was unclear about well users, well, well owners and the, using their own water to irrigate um, that currently have existing wells in back country, for example. Um, that, um, that authority comes from an ordinance that Greenwich um, adopted oh, a while ago now. Um, uh, probably it's in the order of 15, 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it provides the municipality with the authority to um, implement restrictions on people's private wells. And so that is unique. And so any town that wants that sort of um, protection for the shared resource, each individual community has to adopt that ordinance. And as Jeff indicated, um, it doesn't, we don't have the authority to tell somebody they can't drill a well nor does the health department, provided it meets all the health uh, regulations. Um, but it does allow us to deal with um, the use, the level of use um, under specific circumstances. And that would be, and the, the uh, enforcement of, of that type of cycle would have to be on a reported basis of someone noticing mm -hmm. that they were not adhering to a, a two day a week schedule. Yeah. and and. Uh, we've had the same experience as Aquarian that it, people who are watering off schedule maybe don't know about the schedule or like, well, I have a new lawn, so I self-exempted. Um, generally, people have a reason beyond, no, I think I need it. Um, that's a very small fraction. In most cases, I, you know, since I've been the director, we've not had to enforce anything. It's been a call or a letter, and it's all been needed to resolve the issue. We, we've had the same experience, you know, we, um, in, we, we do send drivers around and we, you know, um, we contact uh, people who are watering outside the schedule. Um, now we hear one story, the irrigation contractors tell us that they're being told by some other homeowners that to set it up, you know, outside the schedule and when they get caught, they'll change it. Um, but in general, once we contact them one time, you know, 85, 90% of the people modify their schedule and get in conformance. There is a group of people that will argue about it and yeah. not yeah. be satisfied with it, so. There's always, no matter <laughs> what it is, there's always a group, always a small number. Uh, we also had a question in the chat about contact information um, 
for Jeff. Uh, for questions that they might like to ask, uh, so I don't know if there's you, any. You can, yeah. You know, when you send out the link, you can you can send my email address. I'm, I'm I'm okay with that. I think you can find my email address on the website if you want to. But so when you send out the link, you can send out my email address. <laughs> okay, this has been hot stuff. Um, I think I've covered everything other than do swimming pools draw on municipal water, or is that not allowed to fill your swimming pool? Well, they, most swimming pools south of the Merritt would all be filled by aquarium water, I would think, in Greenwich. That's what I thought. Um, yeah, but in general, I'll be honest, swimming pools are not the issue because in general, they fill them and they top them off a little bit for evaporation. Uh, they aren't as big a water user as people think they are. It's really, it's where the real waste is in irrigation, and that's where a two-day week has all the benefit is the irrigation contractor, if he sets the schedule on April 1st for three days a week, it's gonna water April, May, and all of June, three days a week. And it probably doesn't need to even be turned on until the second week of June. So you've wasted all that water for two and a half months. There's really a month where you might need you know, to water two or three times a week if you really need wanted to. But then once you get to the second half of August and September, but that irrigation system is still going three days a week. That's the issue with the, the irrigation systems is they set them, if you set them in April 1st to go three days a week, they're watering for two and a half months for three days. Like, you know, all that water you've taken out of the reservoir isn't there in July and August when you need it. Exactly. Um, and then another question was, um, how do you know that Greenwich's increase in water use every day of the week during 2020 was due to landscape watering rather than a general increase in domestic water use resulting from more people spending more time at home because of COVID? For example, showering at home rather than at the gym. Um, yeah, there, there, yeah there, there's definitely, um, you know, well, what we could do now, we haven't done it yet, I'll be honest. We could compare it to the winter use. And what you can do, what we generally do to figure out what outdoor water use is, you kind of look at January and February use and you compare it to your summer use. January, February, we figure it's all internal use and it should go up a little bit in the summertime, but it wouldn't go up dramatically. Maybe you shower a little more often in the summertime, but it shouldn't, it's not gonna you know, double or triple. Um, and then that's the difference. We haven't done that analysis. Um, there's probably some of that. There were more people living in Greenwich probably for longer periods of time, you know, than they were in the past, you know, historically. So there's some of that, but is also we can see, uh, I'll be honest, is the, the morning demands. It, the, we start seeing our water levels, you know, the demands kick up at three o'clock in the morning. I don't think there's that many people getting up and taking showers <laughs> at three o'clock in the morning. So. Right, <laughs> right. So you're, it's pretty, it's pretty precise <laughs> where that water is going. Um, okay, and here's another one. Um, out of total annual consumption in Greenwich, uh, it, it, what is used by sports field, what is used most, I think, by oh. sports field activities, soccer, lacrosse, lawn, tennis, golf? Um, but yeah, so so if you, um, I don't have that, so I said 18% was commercial, 10% multifamily. There are a couple more categories. Uh, we have what we call, um, we have a category for uh, government use. It's a very small percentage in Greenwich. It's on, I think it's on your one, one or two percent of the water in Greenwich is used for government uses. So, so that includes their buildings, the schools, um, and their fields. So it's a, it's a small number. Golf courses we talked about. We talked about. Yeah, I, don't, I think they. I don't know how many grass fields there are. There is some irrigation in Greenwich, but the. Um, I don't think that. Yeah, it's, but it's it's not as much as you think. In addition, we were talking about the golf courses before we got on. I looked at our numbers in Greenwich. The, we have the golf courses. They only used a total of 20 million gallons of our water uh, last year in 2020 over a six month period. Um, so they it's a, it's uh, it's not as much as you would think. But they do have ponds on site. They generally have their own wells that they're using. They usually only use our water when. Their, their systems are stressed. So I don't know what they use otherwise, but in the scheme of our water system, the golf courses aren't using a lot and they wouldn't really impact us because they're generally downstream from our reservoirs. So they, their, their use wouldn't impact, you know, water getting into our reservoirs. And thank you for that. And um, another question is Greenwich close to needing a cap on development due to water limitations? 
Um, I don't think so. You know, I think we've taken into account the projections and our demands, and we don't anticipate any kind of restrictions on that. We, we, we can, we can meet the development. There isn't that much more, and there isn't that much more developable land in Greenwich. And even, you know, we get a lot of comments like this from Stamp, people in Stanford that are concerned about the high rises going in. And what we're finding in a lot of cases, the new development, the new buildings use a lot less water than the old buildings do. So even though they're adding more um, apartments and more residents in some of the, in those buildings, they generally are at or even less water because their toilets, their showers, everything are much more efficient than what were in the buildings they replaced. So the new development it isn't as, as big an issue for us to satisfy as people think it or would expect it to be. And then Jeff, I would um, ask a question for you and and um, for John. Are you uh, have you heard a lot about streams that are not getting the flow they want, they need? And you know, do you is that a big issue? And I, I for example, was amazed to see um, that Nor the Norwalk River has an incredible, I think it's trout fishing community that depends on that. And, you know, obviously, you know, our streams need to be cool enough to support the aquatic life and biodiversity. And I just was curious if, if in all of your travels, do you hear people saying, look, there is not enough water that we're, because uh, it is a legitimate concern, you know, when, when we're looking at putting drinking water on our lawns. Um, and you know, I was just curious, is there, what is the reality check there? And, and for these places, say for example, in Fairfield where they're very concerned about um, the Mill Creek or the Mill, you know, these are, these are valid concerns and are there ways, are you putting in, for example, meters, um, gauges and things like that to, to monitor it? Um, and we're just not able to afford to do all of it. Um, what 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 do you think about stream demand right now in in 2021? Well, there are examples in the state where streams have dried up. You know, like I don't know if everybody knows the story about Yukon, where you know they there was a, a stream that was dried, moving water to satisfy the demands at Yukon, and there was a lot of uh, a new project was inv involved in that. We. Um, in general, you know, the stream, you know, John could probably talk to it better than I can. The stream flows are impacted by wells, you know, that, you know, the reservoirs don't have that same impact because we're not pulling the water out of the groundwater. We're storing the ground. We're actually yeah. probably recharging some of the, you know, the groundwater from our reservoirs because the water is remaining there and is leaking, you know, getting into the ground to some level. Um, in the cases of Fairfield, we do have streams, like we, we know what our, you know, and I think it's even on websites, our, what our releases are every day going down the different, you know, the different stream releases from the reservoir. So there's a lot of documentation, a lot of uh, history out there around what our releases are and that they're at the same or, you know, or more than they were, they have been historical. And then we do have a couple well fields in Fairfield that are, are down near, um, or Westport, I'm sorry, Westport, down in, down, downstream of our reservoirs. But actually, the, those capacities are dropping, so we're actually taking a lot less water out of those well fields than we have historically. So they should be having less impact uh, on the stream than they have historically, uh, just because they, they're just getting old. The wells, are, well fields are getting old, and they just don't produce as much water as they used to. Hmm. Uh, John, do you have anything you want to add to that, or? No, I was just going to add though, in this drought this summer, um, as I was telling before, I was in. I'm on the interagency drought work group, so one of the things that I do is. You know, the USGS maintains a large network of stream gauges around the state of Connecticut. We've got about 60 stations as well as about 70 groundwater sites that we monitor. And that data goes into the state water, uh, you know, into the into deciding on drought conditions uh, in Connecticut that, um, you know, affect the use of water and, you know, some of the actions in the state drought plan. Um, I would say the natural streams were the ones that were really dry in the summer, this past summer. So in a way, some of the sites with like reservoirs and, and, and all that upstream, you know, may have some requirements for releases downstream. So in, in my review of some of the data, it's kind of interesting, the Farmington River Basin and the Connecticut area, it's kind of interesting comparing our gauge data from back in the 1960s drought, which is really the drought of record 
to say 2016. And one, one of the things that's really clear is that we manage water quite a bit differently than we did back then where, you know, I think at, the, at that time we might've just shut off the flow or just kept pumping or whatever. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot more going on there. Um, you know, at least as far as that goes. Um, but yeah, you know, there are some I, other I, examples would, of streams drying up too as well. Sorry, what were you going to say, Jeff? I'd, you know, I'd agree with that. I think, we, I think we do a lot more, I think the full environment, when I got in the industry 30 years ago, like John said, I think there was more, uh, the water, the water systems were, you know, they would take what the water they thought they were entitled to as much as they can. I think there's a lot more sensitivity in the industry around that, you know, the most appropriate use of water. You know, Easton, you know, the, uh, we, re, you know, we have Easton Reservoir in Easton and we release a lot more water from it than we have to um, by permit, we, a lot more, uh, because we, we recognize the environmental benefit to the trout streams downstream of that and maintaining those. So I think, um, I think the industry has, uh, is doing a much better job than they did 30 years ago at trying to uh, manage for all the different, you know, taking all, uh, all the different parties into consideration. Yeah, one, uh, one of the other interesting things I was going to bring up is, especially when you look back 100 years or so, and not talking so much about our streams that we're taking drinking water from, because as, as Jeff mentioned, that I think some of our sort of uh, late 19th uh, century planning actually set us up pretty well for future water supply and mm -hmm. uh, protecting lands and all those things. And that may be one of the things that's a lot different from other parts of the country as well. Um, but uh, one of the things I was going to say is in some of our waste receiving streams, like the Quinnipiac River, it's kind of interesting our base flows go up because we have, you know, we take a lot of water for water supply out of the headwaters and then it comes back in the lower reaches of the river as wastewater. And it's kind of interesting. We've actually seen that the summer stream flows in somewhere like the Quinnipiac River are much higher than they were, you know, in the past. And, uh, the other difference really is we probably had a lot more regulation of streams in the far past too, especially if you think about New England, it was an industrial area. There were small dams everywhere, little factories. There were people that were holding back water. Um, think about the Hockenham River right here near our office in East Hartford. There used to be multiple dams on there that would hold the water back for a, several paper mills and things like that, even as recently as the 1960s. So, you know, there are a lot of changes in the way that we manage water in this time period since, you know, kind of the right around the time of the Clean Water Act, you know, going back to like the 1970s. Fascinating. And, and one last thing, John, do, do you want to touch at all about your, what are your, do, are you optimistic about Long Island Sound and what we've done? I'm, it's such a value, valuable resource to people in Greenwich um, and, and, and all of Connecticut. And, you know, I, I've seen Greenwich's water quality, Pat, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it had been, I think up at a B and I think we dropped to a C and I just was curious, you know, where, wh whether we're really gonna ever cure a lot of the, um, the problems we have with nitrogen and, and John, what are your thoughts on that and the sounds and how healthy is the sound now? Um, well, I think there's a lot of improvements. There's clearly been some improvements in the, you know, the area that we have hypoxia in the summer and one of the biggest things is there was a to there was a total maximum daily load requirement for for nitrogen um, that was started with in cooperation with the state of New York back in 2001, and that um, requirement reduced the nitrogen loads from our wastewater treatment facilities in major rivers by I believe it's 58 percent. So it's a huge there's there's a huge amount of success there with the Connecticut's um, nitrogen credit trading program. Mm -hmm. um, that said, um, and I've also done a lot of trend analysis of nitrogen in our larger rivers, and it's definitely way, our, our nitrogen loads are way down. Where we see things not really changing so much are in some of the smaller rivers where we have the possibility of the contribution of non-point source pollutants. So, you know, some of our rivers in like Fairfield County, we see like, I have, we have monitoring going on like Sasco Brook, uh, the Norwalk River, we see sort of creeping, you know, increases in nitrogen loads in some of those. So, um, you know, in areas where we're not sort of, you know, doing that, the, the big heavy lifting of managing the wastewater, we still have this kind of, you know, little bit of increasing development, um, you know, and things like that that's been creeping in over the years. And so we, we maybe are not seeing 
either either flat or maybe even slightly increasing in some of those areas too for nitrogen loads. And so that would be uh, fertilizer for. Um, I think you know we think of some of the sources. Yeah, fertilize you know lawn fertilizers, uh, septic systems. Mm. You know, um, you know some of it is just you know one of the interesting things of note though is that the atmospheric deposition of nitrogen has actually declined a lot as a result of the um, amendments for the Clean Air Act, you know, that go back into the Clinton administration. So um, we've actually seen a, a big decline in nitrogen oxides and precipitation. So, you know, it's a big plus, but one of the things that we're sort of looking at is our forested watersheds, you know, how do they process that nitrogen and you know, do you still have nitrogen that came in a long time ago that's still leaving to streams? And, and how, how is that going to change over time? You know, we have forests that are maturing in the state and, um, you know, those sort of things. And, you know, that there's some unanswered questions as to, you know, whether those areas are saturated with nitrogen or whether we start to see those, you know, the, 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 the nutrient loads come down from those areas as, you know, say the air quality has improved. Hmm. That's encouraging to hear. Um, that some things are working. So great yeah. to know. Um, well, you all have been incredible. Um, this has been great. I mean, we now have hit the two hour mark and we still have um, a major portion of our attendees still listening. Um, so I uh, haven't gone to get dinner or a glass of wine yet. So um, thank you so, so much. Um, Pat, do you want to close us out or any other further comments? I, I, I will say a big shout out to Alex Mock who put together this incredible panel, this incredible series. Um, I find it so interesting and I know it was a lot of hard work and, and she's just amazing. Um, so thank you, Alex. Let's put for together a good program. Yeah, that's Alex's vacant seat. That's her, that's right. her <laughs> office. So she's connected via phone. So she's been listening. Um, the whole thing. So. And just to thank you to, to Jeff and to John for making the time uh, to, again, generous with your time and, and helping out Greenwich to understand these very important water issues and um, always appreciative to have your expertise. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank and Laura, you. thank I you. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Have a good night. Come back next week, everybody. Thank All you, guys. Right. Take do. care and have a good, good night, night everyone. You. Okay. Bye-bye.